won't be walking the stage that much. Um, before we begin, I want to give hug ops to those of you who are on call right now. Thank you for your service. And also hug ops to your teammates who couldn't be here because they're on call. So kicking things off with a quote from a famous hacker movie set in Austin, what would you say you do? So I thought about this. Um, our purpose is to enable the business to succeed. We carry this out by maintaining organizational stability and by recovering to that stable state when stability is threatened or interrupted. We aim for simplicity in our processes, but we embrace the complexity of our environments. We learn how to walk alongside uncertainty. We value efficiency, iteration upon failures, and cross-functional collaboration. And we're often too busy firefighting to step back and reflect upon how we're actually doing on any of those fronts. So am I talking about security operations or am I talking about DevOps? Yes. So it turns out we have a lot of parallels in our work. Um, we share a lot of common threads, yet we don't often end up in the same room unless that room is on fire. But there are a lot of overlapping needs and concerns uh, that can be proactively addressed by both teams with ongoing communication and collaboration. But sometimes it's a struggle bus to even get to that point. We can work to enable shared visibility, uh, implement security controls that won't break production, and production workflows that won't break security, and work on aligning our response procedures for security incidents and outages. And we're never going to do any of these things perfectly, but it's a process. And security and performance can both win over time when our operational teams are working in tandem. Uh, full disclosure to you, my background is in security operations. Um, but uh, so thank you to the SREs in my life who weighed in on this talk to keep me honest. So hopefully it doesn't skew too much in one direction. So why bother collaborating and syncing up? It's really likely that at some point an outage will be caused by a security issue or a security incident will involve production, any number of possibilities, and our two teams will be brought to that room that's on fire. So what if we're meeting for the first time when that happens? If we go into incident response or disaster recovery with zero understanding of each other's needs and values and workflows, we become less effective at carrying out an efficient and thorough investigation and recovery. We might duplicate work. There could be breakdowns in communication. We may have conflicting tactics that might end up causing side fires for one another. And not for lack of trying, but our cognitive capacity to retain any new information is greatly reduced when we're under duress. So when DevOps and SecOps are inevitably called upon to team up in high stress situations, ideally each team should already be pretty well versed in how the other team operates. And aside from the firefighting and downtime of security incidents, our two teams have parallels in our everyday operational work. Both teams usually have some kind of on-call rotation. Our eyes are trained on much of the same infrastructure, even if we're looking for different things. And when we discover something that's off, we spin up response processes to determine severity and root cause and work to recover while mitigating risk to the business, though we may occasionally diverge in the need for immediate recovery versus preservation of current state. So little idiosyncrasies. And we can learn from one another in how we approach detection and response and level up our collective knowledge and work to deconflict our two teams' approaches. So, for those of you in the audience who are playing buzzword bingo, that old security conference pastime, I'm about to check a bunch of boxes for you. Let me move this over. It's okay, there won't be that much downtime. Oh, come on. Sorry, y'all. And we're back. All right, buzzword bingo. That's my free space. Um, our teams are often battling the misconception that security and performance are irreconcilably at odds with one another. Security is seen as the department of no, while DevOps, the department of YOLO. <laughs> Feel free to steal that as you wish. <laughs> 
even one of the quintessential DevOps books, The Phoenix Project, casts the, the security person as this just hilarious bad villain. He's like a caricature. And none of us would be here at a conference about integrating security into DevOps if we bought into this mentality of the two teams being at odds forever. But we also wouldn't be here if all of our teams were working in perfect synergy with one another. And speaking of synergy, Shifting left seems to have worked its way into security's rich tradition of buzzwords in recent months, this idea that we need to inject security earlier in the pipeline. I don't know if earlier was just too many syllables, but left became a thing. Um, the conversations around baking security into DevOps have largely centered around preventative AppSec measures, which is really important. Um, it's, prevention is great. Um, things like secure coding, um, scanning for vulnerable code components like vulnerable dependencies and vulnerable container images and such. And while the spirit of embedding a security perspective earlier on is really good and does reduce the likelihood of having to put out those aforementioned fires, we, there's always going to be some need for cleanup. We can't shift entirely to earlier to the detriment of later. Our respective approaches to monitoring, detection, and response need to be in sync as well. Even as security is starting to become more embedded into the process of building and testing, there are still a number of silos on the later end of the spectrum. Um, DevOps teams might not be as directly entrenched in the security incident response process, while SecOps teams may have a limited view into the nuts and bolts of production infrastructure or how outages are handled, or even that outages are happening at the time. And this shift left directive to align security and development fails to account for the need to align our operations and response processes. And silos, I mentioned. As Ian Coldwater put it in their recent keynote, silos are for grain. Silos often form not out of malice, but just out of chaotic conditions. When we're just trying to put on our own oxygen masks, we, it can become difficult to see beyond our own work. We just get so caught up in just trying to survive. And DevOps and SecOps teams in particular are charged with work that falls primarily on the urgent half of the Eisenhower matrix, just games of whack-a-mole all day. And we may have limited cycles for things in the important but not urgent quadrant, like, say, forging a relationship with a team that you're likely to work with. So dismantling all these pain points can feel like a huge daunting task, but I don't know if you noticed, but daunting tasks are kind of our bread and butter. So keep at it. And above all, the spirit of reciprocity is key in driving culture and, cultural and operational change. We should be modeling the behavior that we expect in return. Before working toward a better future state, both teams need to shed light on our current state, um, check our assumptions about what others might know about our work, and make shared visibility the norm. After all, security is always saying you can't secure what you don't know, and this applies not only to our infrastructure and our accounts, but to other teams' workflows. Admittedly, the first several times I heard the phrase, we need visibility in a security context, I thought it was reflexive. Maybe it's my annual celebration of Bisexual Visibility Day. Um, and yes, the color scheme was intentional. Uh, but I mistook we need visibility as we need to be visible, not as its intended meaning we need to see things. Um, but the self-visibility form of this really still holds true. Operational teams spend so much of their time behind the scenes keeping the lights on. Telling people how and why we keep the lights on isn't considered a fundamental part of the role, yet we somehow expect an understanding of our roles and values that we might not be doing anything to foster. So to enable visibility, we need to actively be visible. What does this look like? Regardless of our physical proximity to one another, we make choices to show up. Intentional transparency in our workflows and conversations, even just deciding to make a Slack channel public instead of private, or asking a question in a public channel instead of a DM, can help break down barriers of understanding. When we seek out information or work through a problem within our own teams, we can opt to do so in a way that's visible and meaningful to an observer from another team. We can also open up our respective runbooks and documentation, our foundations for this everyday problem solving. In being visible about how we keep the lights on, we normalize the flow of open communication and information sharing and lay the groundwork for collaboration in many forms. 
And this was a mental shift for me on a few levels as a security person, as I suspect is the case for a lot of security practitioners. Conventional wisdom has often treated security-adjacent work of any kind as automatically sensitive and in need of strict lockdown, need-to-know basis, all of that, especially incident response work. Uh, it's all considered automatically only for certain people. The f looming fear of insider threats or even just well-meaning employees who don't necessarily know how to handle information led to defaulting away from transparency. Which is weird, because we entrust our colleagues with all kinds of sensitive information. And we just try to give them the tools to uh, equip them to know how to handle it safely. But for some reason, security couldn't do that. Rather than build out security controls to try and reduce the blast radius of any information mishandling, security just led to defaulting away from transparency and locking down the sharing of information, never considering the risks or consequences of not sharing. And the entire DevOps philosophy was born out of similar consequences of communication breakdowns between developers and IT operations. So security teams can learn from the painful mistakes and the ultimate solutions that DevOps brought forth without needing to break entirely new ground. To learn from one another, both teams need to actively hold space for asking questions and sharing knowledge. Actively is the operative word here. Shifting any defaults of an organization's culture takes time and ongoing concerted effort and buy-in from everyone involved. Just as we can't like put a ping pong table in the break room and call it work-life balance, which some places have done, we can't simply say, reach out if you have any questions and just leave it at that. See, there needs to be some care in feeding. Even if your org tends to discourage meetings, you'll find something in your organization's culture and having a dedicated time and space devoted to knowledge sharing and open conversations between SecOps and DevOps makes relationship building a priority. It raises it to, I give you permission to do this here and now. It also gives us license to be vulnerable with one another. Honestly, some of the best insights I had in my last role into what an SRE's day-to-day uh, -day looks like is when they would present their findings from past outages. Um, and we can, so we can be vulnerable with one another. We can say, what did we learn from our failures and shortcomings? What did we, how, how are we surviving the burnout of constantly being on call? And this vulnerability builds trust, and the two become a feedback loop, which paves the way for kindness and connectedness. So when I say kindness, kindness isn't being artificially nice all the time. Nobody's got time for that. And it's also not avoiding conflict. Kindness is honesty plus compassion. It's advocating for our own needs while being mindful of the needs of others. As I mentioned, a lot of our values are a Venn diagram, like preserving stability, building resilience, and forging consistent, repeatable paths to recovery. But our tactics might not always be in complete harmony. And in fact, some of our values, even within our own teams, may be a balancing act, like the need for speed and stability, or the need for agility and risk aversion, things like that. Uh, so in building visibility and opening lines of communication, SecOps and DevOps can work toward operational excellence in ways that are kind to both performance and security posture. Uh, in other words, move fast and break things. That's a pun, you can laugh. Sorry for quoting uh, Zuck Dynasty, the lizard man. <laughs> One of the evergreen challenges of security is how to raise the cost of an attack without being a bottleneck. Gaining visibility into security events on production workloads often presents a big challenge for SecOps teams. How do we implement detection methods without toppling everything over? A few developer friends have even told me that just the word agent makes them cower in fear as they think of visions of an EDR tool eating up computing power in a way that would put a Bitcoin mining rig to shame. As security controls are rolled out, SecOps can partner with DevOps to explore solutions that pose less of a risk to stability. This can take the form of things like setting hard resource limits on, consum on resource consumption or finding ways to decentralize detection agent to avoid single points of failure. Um, also, DevOps, if you do any kind of chaos engineering, chaos engineer your security tooling. Uh, integrate security into this all the way and see how well your workloads stand up against a detection agent, things like that. 
as the security detection and response process becomes increasingly automated, safe for prod approaches to re automated response are crucial. The last thing anyone wants is for a false positive uh, to cause an outage by killing a legitimate process or blocking a legitimate application. Security approaches that would normally take a heavier hand, like application explicit allow, may need a shift for production systems to solely detection rather than enforcement. DevOps teams can be of service to SecOps along these lines in gaining a more complete picture of normal patterns and activity. You know your systems really well. And then by extension, you can give a clearer sense of anomalies. We love anomalies. With increasing capabilities for alerts to flow into collaboration tools and other shared spaces, the time spent investigating why an alert fired and who was involved goes down drastically. This is the huge shift from SecOps spending hours poking at a sim uh, wondering who was involved here before realizing, oh, it was one of my, one of my colleagues. Uh, even if SecOps has no automated response built in, nor any automated outreach uh, to the, the user whose actions triggered the alert, when DevOps can s just see those security alerts, it's pretty quick for one of them to be able to respond, oh yeah, sorry, this was me, this is expected, or yeah, this is me, I didn't realize I shouldn't have been de debugging in prod, or nope. Let's investigate that. Um, this shared visibility into security events streamlines the process of learning what normal looks like and then tuning and refining detection accordingly. And similarly, as SecOps starts to glean what normal looks like in DevOps land, we can advise on what types of anomaly might warrant looping in a security team. SecOps is oftentimes the point of intake for colleagues reporting security concerns anyway. System behaviors that on the surface might look purely like a performance issue may have security implications that we don't realize at first, like an abnormally high AWS bill that turns out to be caused by a crypto miner, and then how did that crypto miner get there? Things like that. When SecOps and DevOps are tapped into each other's work, we're more likely to be visible to one another when spinning up our response procedures. What happens when we do discover a crypto miner gobbling up AWS resources? What happens when these joint detection tools that we set up return a huge flood of true positives? What if an outage uh, leads to downtime of one of our security controls? Because both of our teams have response processes that follow more or less a similar narrative, of triage, investigate, respond, recover, capture takeaways, do RCA, it's really important to surface the subtle differences in our approaches so that we can be clear on expectations. Again, we should bear in mind each other's values. Um, for all of the security incidents that I worked that I thought had a fairly quick turnaround resolution, we probably still had nothing on DevOps teams where the quickest path to restoring current state is paramount. And while SecOps still aims for efficient uh, incident response, capturing current state is often more important than taking an action five minutes sooner. So whenever we tap each other to work on resolving an incident, setting expectations up front will minimize misunderstandings. While we can't prevent every single fire, SecOps and DevOps can collaborate in preparing for the inevitable. Uh, though chaos engineering is familiar to the DevOps world, there are other ways to intentionally inject chaos into our workflows to stress test our resilience. Who here has ever participated in security incident response exercise or a tabletop? Okay, a few hands. Uh, what about like a game day for SREs? Okay, still a few hands. It turns out that uh, both teams, uh, SecOps and DevOps, have ways of gamifying um, their, their response processes to simulate an incident, um, an outage or an IR, uh, in order to test response procedures and surface areas for improvement. They're usually time boxed and isolated from the ability to cause actual harm. Um, it's more than I could fit into a 20 minute talk, but if you want a good uh, intro to this concept, uh, my former coworker Miranda Fullerton gave a talk at B-Side San Francisco on um, gamifying incident response. Um, the, the specific goals in the narrative of each exercise depend on the problem to be solved. A, a very early stage team might just focus on testing their own response procedures, because if you, you're not solid in how you or your own team can handle it, uh, things are going to break when you start to loop in other teams. 
that as a team solidifies their incident handling capabilities, we can shift the focus and the problem to be solved in our exercises to testing the ability to work alongside other teams in response scenarios. So now the problems to be solved become things like identifying gaps in knowledge and visibility, finding pain points in communication, where are the breakdowns happening? How well do we hand off things between participants in the response? Who needs to be in the room? Um, what are some assumptions that are made about our systems and our processes? Who doesn't have access to a thing that they need access to? So we do all of this by simulating that there is a room, we're all in it, and the room is on fire. And maybe some of us are on fire too. Availability extends not just to infrastructure, but to people. <laughs> so we did this sometimes in my last role. We occasionally combined incident response exercises, and um, which were mostly owned by the security operations team, and uh, business continuity disaster recovery exercises for SREs. We would just devise a joint scenario. At other times, um, the team would de devise incident response exercise scenarios that just heavily involved SREs not as responders, but as subject matter experts. Uh, identifying some of our miscommunications and pain points in a simulated uh, response situation allowed us to work together more smoothly when actual incidents arose. So there's no, there's no perfect here. It's all about iteration. We find where our pain points are, we fix those pain points, then we identify new pain points, rinse, spin, repeat. Um, but point of these exercises, these IR exercises and game days, is to identify some of the pain points in a sandbox setting so that they don't come up when we're actually responding. So what comes next? The fact that so many of us have taken time here to show up, uh, share knowledge, and learn from one another today is a really good sign for the future of forging alliances between DevOps and SecOps teams and other security teams as well. A lot of these things apply to any time you've got a silo that you want to kick down. So I highly encourage you to use today to start those conversations. Ask someone in a different role what their day-to-day -day looks like. Find out what challenges they're facing. Be vulnerable about your own challenges that you're facing. And keep an open mind for opportunities to collaborate. Um, oh god, I, to I just realized I totally missed an opportunity to quote Vanilla Ice, stop, collaborate, and listen. <laughs> So I went for an old candy commercial instead. Just like chocolate and peanut butter, we become even better when we join forces and go forth as two great ops that ops great together. Thanks. <laughs>